I'd like to say good afternoon to everyone and welcome uh, into the house of faith. More than anything, I think it is a good time to celebrate Jesus, not because uh, we are alive, but because of the fact that we have his salvation, we have his forgiveness, and we know where we're going. By the grace of God, Today, I'm going to share an interesting topic with you all, and I title it Sin Responsible for Wrong perfect, uh, Perception of God. Basically, what this means is that we're going to be looking at the fact that the way we see God, the way we perceive God, sometimes or most of the times can be distorted by sin. And uh, as I just meditate, I realize that more than any time in the history of mankind, we are in such a dire strait where sin is naturally becoming the way that things are done. I'm sure that most of you do not need me to define it, especially because the apostles didn't even deny the fact that the saints have to battle with sin except that we are called to the place where no matter how bad the battle is, no matter how bad the temptation is, we should be able to overcome the power of sin because Jesus won the battle. Before we go deep, I would like to share a few Bible verses for you and you will agree with me that sin is indeed a distortioner of our perception of God. In Psalm 38, verse 3, the psalmist says, There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, neither is there rest in my bone because of my sin. The Proverbs 13, 6 says, Righteousness keep him that is upright in the way, for the wicked overthrows, wickedness overthrows the sinner. I'm not going to try and explain them for now. I will, I will just make a summary. And the book of Leviticus 26, 15 to 18, it says, if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgment, so that you will not you do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant, you will not prosper. I will also do this to you. I will even appoint you terror, consumption. Consumption means destruction and the burning egg that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of the eyes, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies, that they hate you shall reign over you. If you do not yet for all this obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. In Proverbs 11, verse 9, it says, As righteousness tends to life, so he that pursues evil pursues it to his own death. Now, as you hear all this scripture, what you're going to be feeling is like, whoa, this thing we call sin is horrible. Evil pursues sinners. In Proverbs 13, verse 21, But the righteous good shall be repaid unto him. In Proverbs 28, verse 1, it says, the wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. I, I take this particular studies personally, especially because as I watch the world where we are, I realize that we are in danger of losing a proper perspective of God if we do not stand in righteousness, if we do not succeed to overcome the battle of sin, our image of God can be distorted. And once that image is changed, we cannot in any way serve God, be effective in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and sometimes we may end up forgetting that our sins have been forgiven as the children of God. Let me give you a summary of the verses we read. The first thing is that sin brings fear. When I watch the way we pray, when I watch the prayer points we make, the crux of our prayer oftentimes is because we are afraid. 
It's because we are afraid. And the reason that is happening is that our conscience is telling us that something is out there that is about to pay us for the choices that we have made. Number two, sin brings humiliation. I have seen how sin can destroy God's blessing and bring people down. Unfortunately, sin is very attractive. It is very tasty. But the end of it all often leads to humiliation and sourness in our mouth. Sin brings guilt to life. Even when somebody has forgiven you, even when somebody has forgotten what you did, but sin will always remind you, you see that man? You stole his money. You see that man? You hurt his wife. You hurt his daughter. Sin always brings that memory alive. Sin brings bondage. Bondage is like a chain. It ties your soul. It ties your spirit. It ties your body. You cannot do what you really want to do because sin hems you around. Anybody who is in chain cannot do anything. And sadly enough, the ultimate consequence of sin is that it brings death alive. I like to tell you something about what I'm trying to say that sin has the ability to affect the way we view God. The first thing that sin is, is like, it's like tears in your eyes. When you are crying, can you see clearly? No, because water prevents light from traveling straight to the point where your eyes can see clearly. Sin is like tears in the eyes. You are seen, but the thing is not clear. You are seen, but you don't understand what you are seeing. You don't have a clear image of the totality of what your brain is struggling to see. That is how sin operates. You see, somebody like Adam and Eve, after they disobeyed God and they ate from the garden that they were not the three of the knowledge of good and evil that they were not supposed to eat, the scripture says the moment they heard the, heard the voice of God, they ran and went to hide themselves. Isn't it ironic? God wasn't even pursuing them when they began to run. God did not expect the blessings that were in the Garden of Eden to become a burden to them. But the moment sin was invented into their soul, flight and fear came into their lives. Hear this. In verse 8 of chapter 3, Genesis, it says, And they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and Eve, Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. If one considers the nature of the fellowship between Adam and Eve, you will realize that the fear flight is a real sad situation. Of course, if you probe deep, we'll find out why the choice of action is fear flight. As the descendants of Adam, that is you and I, when we sin, our first reaction is to run from God. But look at the foolishness. Can somebody really run from God? Can we really run from the one whose spirit is everywhere that sees everything? Can we hide from the almighty, the all-powerful God, the one who is able to become a man and shed his blood for us and broke the power of death, can we really run from him? Can we really run from the person who destroyed the power of death and rose again? We cannot. But this is what happens. Sin absolutely convinces you you can hide. Sin convinces you you can run. Whereas the question is, where would you run to? We lose the courage we have for fellowship with God and the fellowship with saints when sin is installed in us. You cannot be in relationship with people. You're afraid they will see the sin you have made. You're afraid some prophet will sense your sin because sin is a tormentor. And the worst of it is the fellowship you are supposed to have with God when you wake up at night to be in prayer all of that is stolen away. Not only does sin do that, it stops us from praying because it tells us your guilt is ringing out to God. 
Your guilt is condemning you. You cannot pray to a holy God. Whereas that is not the way God says things. What is ironic is that God wants to hear even from the sinners. God said, do I delight in the death of the sinner? Don't I take pleasure in it when a sinner turns away from their sin? And one of the other things that happen when sin is installed is that our enthusiasm for the word of God is taken away. We don't read the scripture anymore. Our heart becomes hardened. We become extremely occupied with other things in the name of being busy. And you know, the saddest part is this. The moment you start to run from the word of God, you are beginning to run from the pilot of your life. You are beginning to run from life that is supposed to keep you from destruction. And not only do you run from those things, at the end of the day, your heart becomes hardened. Your heart becomes hardened. And all of this, they are due to the distortion that sin brings to the way we see God. I want you to hear this. Our perception is really what sin likes to attack. Our perception. In other words, the way you see things. So I may tell you the truth today. And then once you see me next time, you start to run. Sin does that. I told you the truth because I love you, right? But sin will say, no, that man is judging you. That man does not want your best. And the reason it is doing that is to keep you away from that word of life that is able to save you. It is the same with sin and God. Once we start to sin, sin begins to change the eyeglass we wear. He begins to make us see God in a very different light. <clears throat> Friends, sin tries to convince us that God is a vindictive God, that he is not tolerant, and that all God cares about is to punish us. Once this lies or distortion enters your mind, what follows is fear. You begin to work hard, and eventually you cannot satisfy God by your works, and therefore your love towards God will become cold. In that state, you cannot love a God that is constantly saying, what are you looking at? What are you thinking? What did you do yesterday? I saw you yesterday morning. Nobody wants to have such a God. But I want you to hear this. What the devil is really doing through such a sin is to change the way you view God. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 1 to 2, he says, God is saying, look, where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or to which of your creditors did I sell you? Because of your sins, you were sold. Because of your transgression, your mother was sent away. When I came, why was there no one? When I called, why was there no one to answer? Was my arm too short to deliver you? Do you think I lack the strength to rescue you? Because of a mere rebuke, I can dry up the sea. I turn rivers into a desert, and the fish in them, they rot because there's no water, and they all die of thirst. God is saying, look, the way you are seeing me is wrong. I am not the image you have about me. I am not the one who sold your mother. I didn't send you into slavery. My hand is strong enough to deliver you. You are the one who ran away from me. I have all the power that I need to do whatever I want to do, even though it concerns you. And this is the heart of God for us. The devil wants to change that. The devil and the, and the, the essence of sin wants us to believe that it is God that is making the enemy succeed against you. That it is God that is making you that you cannot have a baby. That it is God that is making it that you are suffering in poverty. Because God has not forgiven you for what you did yesterday or two, days, or two years ago. But God is saying, if I want to do that, don't I have the power? That's not how I do things. And he's saying, I want you to see. It is your sin that has cost you. 
not to see clearly. God is defending himself. In this particular passage I just read, God defending himself from our accusation towards him. That's what I want you to see. When your perception of God is wrong, you are accusing him and his goodness. And what the Lord God is saying is that he is not responsible for the way you think and the bondage that we are going through in the way we think. Rather, it is our sin choices that is responsible for the wrong way that we perceive him. And I feel that when we make mistakes, when we err, the first thing we are looking for is that there's going to be thunder, there's going to be fire, there's going to be earthquake. We are always looking, is somebody going to cause us? Is somebody going to do this thing to us? But God is not responsible for that. Our sin is what is responsible for the way that people see such things. I want you to hear this. God knows how much we can take. Can you just repeat it? God, it is human who do not know how much you can take. You know, those days growing up, they put load on some children's head. They're supposed to put small load on a child's head. Sometimes some parents don't know when to stop. You keep piling it and piling it until the load breaks the child down. That is the way man does his things. God knows our limits. God knows your limits. I want you to repeat it to yourself. God knows my limit. I want you to see this. In Isaiah 57, beginning from verse 14, he says, build up, build up, prepare the road. Remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. For this is what the high and the exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and low in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of people who are contrite. I will not accuse them forever, nor will I always be angry, for then they would faint away because of me. Hear this. God is saying, look, I am not always going to accuse you. I am not always going to blame you. Because if I continue to blame you, you will eventually be discouraged and you will faint. And my desire is not for you to faint. The very people, he says, the very people I have created, Yes, I was angry because of their sin and greed. I punished them and I hid my face in my anger. Yet they kept on their willful ways. I have seen their ways, but I will heal them. Have you seen what this type of a God is? It says, although you are continuing to sin, you still stay in your way and the way you see me is wrong, but I still want to heal you. That is who this God is. He says, I will guide them. I will restore comfort to Israel's mourners, creating praises on their lips. He says, peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord. I will heal them. But the wicked are like the toss and sea. They cannot find rest. Whose waves cast up mud and mire? There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. I want you to hear this, that God knows that as long as we remain under the yoke of guilt and accusations, our heart will eventually fail. A lot of reasons why young men and women don't come to church again is because they're afraid of God. They, the sin they find themselves has persistently bound them and they are thinking, eh, what is there going to be? It's only going to be judgment. And they convince themselves that God is really, really hateful at them. And the consequence is they will stop going to church. But I want you to hear this. Because God is a good God, because God has a purpose for his creation and his children, he would not allow such a thing to happen to his children. God does not take the light in the fact that his children become discouraged with him. 
His desire is to restore us all. So that even when we are guilty, God still wants to find a way to deliver us from guilt and its consequence. His kindness and understanding, they are what the devil wants to destroy in our lives. God wants you to believe that God is not kind. Satan wants you to believe that God is not kind, that he's not understanding. He will try to destroy your view of God, the way you see God, and make you project your own wickedness upon God instead of repenting and allowing God's grace to move you to glory. Another thing I want you to hear is this, that God knows your physical frame. God knows how much your physical body and your spiritual body and your soul can take. In Psalm 103, verses 6, beginning, he says the Lord works righteousness and justice for those who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger. He is full of love. He will not always accuse, nor will he abort his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Why? Because God knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. You know, sometimes when parents are angry at their children, they forget that they are dealing with children. They forget that they have not really matured. They forget that they don't have the experience. And what they end up doing in the way they react with the kids or interact with them is that the kids become very afraid of them. So that when they come back from work, instead of the children running to their father, they will hide. And God does not want that same thing to happen to his children. He says, I know your frame. I know your weakness. I know your tendency. I know the temptations that confront you. I will not always be angry at you. I want you to hear this. The Lord who started a good work in us has every intention to fulfill it. He is not like the politicians who start a project just before elections so that they can get our votes and afterwards abandon it. God is not like that. God doesn't want to give you taste so you feel good, so that you can worship him, then he will abandon you. God saved us for a purpose. He desires for us to enjoy eternity with him. Although sin will never have access into the kingdom of God, and therefore sin must be punished, even when he does not want us to be discouraged to the point of breaking down and giving up. As parents, we do not want to discourage our children. We are careful in the way we talk to them because we want them to listen to our counsel and our, dis and our disagreements so that although we may not agree with them, they will listen to us and then thereby get to a better place in life. But hear this, God is more in tune with our nature. God knows what you are thinking. God knows what is in your brain. He knows the limitation because he put that limitation in us. He does not desire for us to be pushed beyond our limits. And therefore, because of this, even when we are at our worst behaviors, he wants to deliver us from our sins. Unfortunately, sin always wants to deny us this reality that God is a compassionate and a merciful God. Sin affects the way we view how God sees us. Sin encourages us to run from God. Sin wants us to hate and blame God for our problems, while it is sin that is actually provoking that suffering in us. My friend, I want you to hear one major reason why so many Christians have not been able to enter into that intimate place with God and remain there is because of this perception that sin has imposed upon them. 
Sin has changed the perception of so many people about God, therefore denying them access to God's compassion and mercy. Hear this. God says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I like this particular verse in verse 13. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed and he remembers that we are dust. Unrepentance is a big problem. That is what I want you to hear. Perhaps one of the saddest consequences of a distorted perception of God is that sin can keep our hearts hardened. It's very important. Sin always brings humiliation alive. Yeah, the, the opposite of humiliation is promotion. Humiliation always is around wherever sin is. And the question that you need to ask is, why do we always choose to accumulate ourselves once we have sinned? Why don't we look for some noble way to cover ourselves? Look at Adam and Eve. The moment they sinned, what did they do? They went and used leaves to cover themselves. <laughs> what type of madness is that? Can leave really cover you? That is humiliation. That is real humiliation. And unfortunately, the children of Adam, we are still doing that today. It is obvious that Adam and Eve felt guilty and that was their reaction. The sad part of all of this is that sin convinces us that because we are falling, we are incapable of standing up and the best thing is to just submit to sin. You remember in the, in the school days, in college, in grammar school, in the university, sin always tells you, eh, you have already committed sin now. And you know there's judgment. You must, if you must suffer, just do it well. Sin does that. You have already sinned, just do it. You know that if they punish you, you know what they're punishing you for. But what sin forgets to tell you is that God's punishment is not like the punishment of man. Sin forgets to tell you that once you fall away from God, it is an eternal separation. It is like putting your hand inside a fire and you cannot take it out forever. It is like your soul being cut out of light. You know there's something out there good for you, but you cannot get to it because that is what sin is hiding from us. That is what sin humiliation does. I want you to hear this. That is not the best way to think as children of God. The truth is that this is a demonic deceit and delusion. What is happening at this point in a man's life is that we are being conditioned to all sorts of decadence and hopelessness. At this stage, our mind is being completely robbed of life, which may eventually lead to a hardening of heart. A stone is hard. Stone doesn't feel anything. The moment the heart of a man becomes like a stone, you cannot feel anything. You will do the wrong thing. Your mind will convince you. Anyway, they are going to punish you. Anyway, you are in hell. Anyway, you are going to die. But he forgets to tell you that even death is not the end of life. That is what sin does. And this is why we need to make sure that the way we perceive God is the right way. Our output of love of God, when it becomes changed because of sin, lies will grow in our hearts. Hear this. He says in John chapter 8, verse 40, beginning, but now you seek to kill me. A man that has told you the truth, which I have heard from God, this did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father, then said to him, Are we not born? We are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came forth from the father, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? 
even because you cannot hear my word. Hear this. You are of your father, the devil, and the loss of your father, that is what you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he did not stay in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks his own, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Friends, at this point of sinning in our minds, have already begun to process a process of falling into bondage. Our mind, our body, our rationale begin to adapt to this new essence gradually. And the ultimate part of it is it leads to death. This stage is what the apostle called past feeling, when you don't feel anything anymore. When it is easy for somebody because you want to make money to do human sacrifice, to hurt other people, to poison them, to take other people's wives, uh, to steal from where you shouldn't steal. Because at this point, you don't care anymore. You have reached that place where you have past feeling to accuse somebody falsely, to lie directly through your own mouth that they did something they didn't do because you know by lying, you will take them down and take something from them. The answer is simple, dear friends. What is happening here is that once people get to this place, God takes his hand away from such people. And then every other madness that is possible will fall over them. Hear what the apostle said. He says, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things that are not convenient. Because when they knew God, they didn't thank him. They didn't acknowledge him. Their hearts became so crazy for vanity. And God said, that's what you want. Go, I will leave you. And it is from that that we always run from. What is it? Our conscience is now saying, look, Tony, you know what is better for you. And this is what the Lord himself is saying. And you have refused. The moment that conscience is activated in the individual, the individual begins to run. And the idea here is Satan will begin to change the way you see God. But can we make any excuse before our conscience? In the book of Acts chapter 16, it says, herein I do exercise myself to have always a conscience that is void of offense towards God and towards men. In Romans 2, 15, it says, which should the work of the law written in their heart their conscience is always bearing witness. And their thoughts, the mean, while accusing or else excusing one another. There is no escape because our conscience is constantly talking to us. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 25 puts it like this. Whoever is sold in the shambles, whatever is sold in the shambles, eat, ask no questions for the sake of your conscience. The idea here is that you cannot run from your conscience. My dear friend, somebody will say, whoa, Pastor Tony, you're so right about how our perception changes. What do we do? It's very simple. How do we do to change the way we view God? Because if you don't view God the right way, you will never come into his presence for blessing. And that's why a lot of people have not come to him because they don't understand that he's a kind, he's a loving, he's a benevolent God, he's a savior who delights in the repentance of the sinners. The first thing that a person must do is to turn to God. That's the place to start. What does this mean to turn to God? If you have had this sermon today, and you have not been saved. You have never said yes to Jesus. That's the place we are going. You must say that yes. You must say, Jesus, I say yes to your sacrifice. That's the place to start. Because by your own strength, you cannot do anything. You have to say yes to that sacrifice. And by that sacrifice, you are translated from darkness into God's eternal light. The scales that have been on your face or your eyes will then fall off and you begin to see God for who he is. And so the first thing we're going to do is that if there's any man here 
who has not succeeded to say yes to God, any woman. Today will be the right opportunity to say yes to God. Number two, repentance is the next thing once you have said yes to Jesus. Hear this. In Zechariah chapter 1, verse 2b, it says, Turn unto me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, says the Lord of hosts. Turn unto God. Any of us whose perception of God has changed in any way, especially those who have already said yes to God, and sin has begun to change the way you view God. The first thing is to go back to God. It's not turning your back to him. He says, turn unto me. God says, look at me and I will look at you. God is literally saying, come to me and I will come to you. No matter what the sin may be, turn to me. That's what God is saying. And if you turn to me, I will take your goggle away and give you a clear mind and clear eyes. And you can see me and know me for who I truly am. Turn to God. That's the first thing. Turning to God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verses 9b. Hear what God says. I have blotted out as a thick cloud your transgressions and as a cloud your sin. Return to me for... I have redeemed thee. My dear friends, you have heard one of the things that sin does. It changes the way we view God. It causes us to run from God. It causes us to be afraid of God's blessings. It takes us away from the place where we can have help because we are afraid of him. We are feeling guilty. But God is simply saying this. Turn to me. Because I have wiped away your sin that may have been as thick as cloud. Just come to me because I am the one who is able to wipe away your transgression. And God is saying, look, I, I have redeemed you. And we need to see this. What does it mean to return to God? The first thing that it means to return to God really starts with your renewal of your mind. That is, the, in other words, the way you think needs to change. It starts with remembering the word of God. It starts with going back to the word of God. It starts with beginning to eat the word of God again and meditating on it and not having alternative things anymore in your life. It starts with appreciating that the word of God is light. It is your lamp that guides you again. It starts with creating a new passion for the word of God. A lot of sin, this is the problem. The moment sin changes your perspective, the first thing you stop to do is you stop to read the word of God because you're afraid the word will convict you. And once you stop to read the word of God, you stop to pray. Your prayer life goes down. And the more prayer life goes down, that heat, that fire that is refining, that is changing, that renews somebody, that comes from intimacy with God, that heat is gone. And once that heat is gone, you have quenched the spirit. The Apostle Paul is encouraging us today. He says, therefore, in Romans chapter 12, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. He says, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, the one that is good, pleasing, and perfect for you. John says, if we sin, we have an advocate. Somebody who stands in the gap between us and God says, if we do that, we have. He says, if any man comes to me, I will in no way cast away. And as I'm talking about this, I am speaking to every one of us that there's need to check our perspective. When there's tears in the eyes, you don't see clearly. When there's tears on your glasses, 
Your vision is blurred. You may think you're seeing something, but you may be seeing something that is totally different. I would like to bring the sermon to the end today by first of all asking, is there anybody among us? And this is a serious, serious question that has not said yes to Jesus. Like you have never said that prayer, Jesus, I accept your sacrifice because I am a child of Adam. I have fallen into sin. I tell you, don't take it for granted if you have never said it because you don't have control over life. Tomorrow is not in your hand. The devil has the ability. Sin convinces people. You still have time. Wait till your child is sick, till your children are sick, till your wife is sick, and then you can go to that pastor to pray for you. But it may be very late there. And if there's anybody among us that has not said yes to Jesus, all you need to do is to say yes. I'm not saying stop committing sin because you can't. No man can stop committing sin by their own strength, except through the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. All you need to do is say, yes, I accept your sacrifice. If there's anybody here, please don't waste time. Just show with your hand. Is there anybody who wants to say yes to the sacrifice of Jesus? Anybody? Great. Thank God. It means everybody's saved. The second question is, if there's anybody who really wants their perspective about God to change, I want you to show your hand. You want the way you view God to change. Praise God. Hallelujah. God bless those hands. God bless those hands. I'll pray for you. Father of light, I plead the blood of Jesus today because you are our freedom. You are our deliverer. You are the source of our refuge. As many today who have responded to your word, who wants the perspective of you to change? I ask you to salve their eyes in the name of Jesus. I ask you to touch them with the blood of the Lamb. Father, change our perspective. Let us see you as the good God that you are. Father, bring us back from the bondage of fear and guilt and help us, Lord, to accept you as our good Father. Father, I pray for the ones in their mind who have said to Jesus, Lord, let that truth come into reality, Lord. Lord, I bless your name. We give you all the glory and the honor in your precious and holy name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Shall we share the grace together? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord be